So our next speaker is Zsófia Jules, who will talk about image reconstruction in proton computed tomography. Thank you and welcome everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay, so uh, thank you. As Balázs mentioned, I will talk about image reconstruction in proton computed tomography. Uh, just a quick outline what I will talk about exactly. So I will first start with uh, proton therapy itself. What is it? What are its advantages or difficulties? Then I will uh, talk a bit about the Bergen Proton CT collaboration uh, and image reconstruction techniques. Uh, I will soon get onto the iterative methods and the Richardson-Lucy algorithm, which is uh, my main topic and which I use for uh, image reconstruction. Uh, I will talk about the development of the framework that utilizes this Richardson-Lucy algorithm, uh, the evaluation of uh, the algorithm with different phantoms. I will talk about my results and then a quick summary. So as you all know, one of the biggest uh, challenges in medical world is uh, cancer treatment. Uh, we all want to uh, find the best solution to treat cancer. And for this, we can use uh, surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or even immunotherapy. Uh, today, I will talk about radiotherapy, as you might have guessed, uh, which uses ionizing particles, aka radiation. Now, what type of particles can uh, radiotherapy use? Well, uh, the most widely used particles are photons, of course, but there are uh, very outstanding uh, results in cancer treatment uh, that is made with uh, proton or heavy ion therapy. The reason why uh, these two are not that widespread is, uh, for example, the size of uh, the instruments. You can see them here. Um, it is very difficult to build an instrument like this and uh, cost a fortune. However, uh, as I mentioned, there are outstanding results uh, in cancer treatment with uh, protons or heavy ions. Now I will just talk about uh, why uh, is proton therapy so outstanding or uh, other heavy ion, for example, carbon ion therapy. And for this, to understand, let's look at these two pictures. Uh, here you can see what happens to a proton when it enters some kind of medium. Uh, it will scatter and lose uh, its energy through Coulomb scattering or Coulomb interactions. And uh, it will deposit its energy, which will lead to this so-called Bragg peak. And this Bragg peak is uh, exactly why uh, proton therapy is outstanding because uh, with this Bragg peak, we can uh, set the dose. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this is the relative dose uh, as a function of depth in water. Um, and you can see that when we use photons, uh, this dose is less localized uh, and the maximum of it is. Uh, at the beginning of this medium. So when we use protons or carbon ions, uh, this dose is much more localized uh, and we can uh, fine tune it to deposit the maximum energy inside the tumor itself. So this is uh, why proton therapy is so good. But there is a different, uh, another reason why it's uh, less widespread. And this is a problem with the imaging. Now, when we do some kind of cancer treatment, uh, some radiotherapy, for example, we need uh, to do some imaging before it uh, for the doctor to see and the physicist uh, how we should do the dosage planning. Uh, today, uh, the instrument that is used for imaging is X-ray CT. Uh, and what we need to do when we do proton therapy is the range of the protons, uh, which is called relative stopping power. I will call it uh, RSP. 
which explains how much it slows down in a material uh, compared to water. Uh, now, when we image, we do the imaging with X-ray, uh, we have to make a conversion between the so-called Hounsford units, which are uh, which is a quantitative scale uh, of the absorption of the X-rays and the uh, energy loss of protons, so the RSP. And when we do this conversion, we will get a lot of errors. So what can be the solution? Well, let's do the imaging with protons. So let's do the imaging with proton computed tomography, proton CT. Now, uh, I uh, want to talk a bit about the Bergen Proton CT collaboration, of which uh, I am lucky to be part of. Uh, this is a collaboration that is based at the University of Bergen, and its goal is to build a proton CT, which is based on the high energy particle detectors, uh, for the one that is used in uh, the CERN Alice collaboration. Uh, you can see uh, this PCT here, or the layout of it. Uh, and uh, this detector system is based on this so called Alpite chip. Uh, which you can see here. Uh, this is a very small chip, and uh, the reason why it's uh, very interesting and outstanding is that uh, the readout electronics is uh, on the same. So uh, the chip contains the readout electronics as well as uh, the sensitive layer. Uh, so how does this workflow look like? So how do we get from uh, irradiating the patient to the images? First, we have to ir irradiate the, pa uh, the patient, or in our case, the phantoms, with high energy protons. Uh, now, I have to mention that high energy here means uh, around 100 uh, mega electron volts, not uh, the high energy used in the CERN Alice experiment. Uh, and the next step is when the detector system, this chip, senses the signals, uh, and then we can process the signals. Uh, this will be explained a bit more uh, by my colleague, Ben Sedudash, who will speak right after me. And then the last step is the reconstruction of the image, which is uh, where I uh, come to the picture. Uh, there are different image reconstruction techniques that we can use. Uh, there are two big groups, so to say. One is based on integral transformations. Uh, these are called redden and inverse redden transformations. Uh, these are uh, sort of easy to carry out. However, uh, sadly, they cannot be used for proton CT uh, since they uh, are based on the fact that uh, photons go through uh, in a straight line uh, through the material. And this is not true for protons due to the nuclear scattering. And there is the other big group of image reconstruction techniques, uh, the iterative reconstruction techniques, which model the problem as a linear equation system, of which you can see one here. Uh, this A is a matrix that contains the interaction coefficients between protons and pixels or voxels. We talk about pixels when uh, we are in two dimension and voxels when we are in three dimension. Uh, X is the vector that we uh, we see. We want to know uh, the values of it. This contains the estimated proton RSP values, which we want to know. And Y is the vector that contains the known uh, water equivalent path length values of the protons. Uh, now, how does uh, an iterative uh, algorithm work? So we have an initial image. It's it's a blurred image. We, we cannot really see, cannot really tell anything from this. So we apply some kind of corrections on this image. We review this corrected image. We apply some further corrections. We review it again, and we repeat this for, for uh, n number of iterations. These iterations end if we get a satisfactory image, and slash or we got uh, converged corrections. And here comes the interesting part. Uh, 
I have been working on an algorithm that uh, has not yet been used for medical imaging, and it is called the richardson lucy algorithm. This is also a statistical iterative algorithm, which is based on the maximum likelihood expectation maximization method. And it was originally used in optics. Uh, it basically works uh, based on this uh, equation, which is actually the same equation or same, uh, I will show you again, is the same linear equation system that I showed you here. Uh, where this x is the vector that contains the RSP values. This is what we want to estimate. Uh, this k is the number of iterations. Y is the vector that contains the water equivalent path length values. And A is the matrix, which contains the interaction coefficients between the proton trajectories and the voxels or pixels. Uh, this ratio is called the Hadamard ratio. I, I will talk a bit about it later. Uh, so for this, algorithm or for this reconstruction to work, we need some kind of input data, which we would get from the detector of the real patient, of course, but uh, this is still a work in progress uh, in uh, Bergen. So my input data is from uh, Monte Carlo simulations. I will also talk about it uh, a bit in details later. Uh, the next step is the most likely path calculation of the protons, which you can see here. Uh, we basically want to estimate the protons path inside the phantom or the patient, uh, knowing the uh, initial uh, position and direction and the uh, position and direction when it comes out of the phantom. Uh, and the last step is the RSP distribution calculation, which uses this richardson lucy algorithm. Uh, this is not a very difficult task mathematically, but it is very difficult to carry out technically since we are talking about millions of proton trajectories. So this is where uh, it gets interesting in connection with the GPU or uh, CUDA, which I used to uh, make our lives easier and speed up these calculations a bit. My goal with this uh, research or work was to find the optimization regarding the number of iterations and the protons. Uh, so I want to talk about how, how I developed this framework. Uh, so again, the steps of the framework uh, look like this. First, I generated data with Monte Carlo simulations. For this, I used uh, Gen4 and Gate. Now, this is a very time-consuming step, so I applied parallelization to this to make it faster. Uh, then I uh, added simulation. I applied uh, a so-called three sigma filtering, which filters out the directions and uh, the water equivalent path length values of the protons that uh, went under uh, uh, nuclear interactions uh, that resulted in uh, big angles of uh, scattering. Uh, the next step is this uh, most likely path calculation that I have already mentioned, where we calculate the most likely position of the Uh, the last step, which is the calculation of the RSP distribution with this richardson lucy algorithm. Now, this calculation is a C++ code, which I accelerated with the GPU. Uh, and in this, we uh, uh, calculate the Hadamard ratios. And uh, there was an improvement in this uh, uh, after the first version of this uh, code, uh, because now we can give batches, which are, which, uh, so you can imagine these batches, uh, if you imagine that we have a lot of data, and we sort of group them, uh, and we can give how many protons, proton numbers, or proton trajectories we want in one batch, 
And what I used was uh, 20,000 uh, protons per batch. Uh, and in a batch, we start doing these iterations and always compare uh, the n minus one and the nth iteration. And if uh, the mean squared error between them is smaller than uh, a given threshold, then we will jump uh, out of this batch, go to the next batch and stop the iterations in the previous batch. Uh, and now I would like to talk about the evaluation of the algorithm. I have done this with two different phantoms uh, made for this uh, evaluation specifically. Uh, these types of evaluations. Uh, the first uh, phantom that I used was the Derenzet phantom uh, for uh, measuring spatial resolution, which is a 200 millimeter diameter water cylinder uh, with six sectors of uh, 1.5 to 6 millimeter diameter aluminum rods. And the other phantom was the CPP 404 phantom, which is used for measuring the reconstruction accuracy uh, of the RST values and has, uh, it is a 150 millimeter diameter epoxy cylinder and it has eight different material inserts or rods with a 12.2 millimeter diameter. Uh, I first want to talk about the Derenzo uh, phantom. You can see here the reconstruction of it with different proton numbers. As you can see, it gets uh, better and better as we increase the proton number. And uh, the question is, how do we uh, say anything about the spatial resolution with this phantom. So there is very good measure for spatial resolution and it is called the modulation transfer function, which tells us how well we can differentiate between two objects on an image. Uh, how we get this now, uh, if we look at this picture, you can see that uh, we can say something about contrast when we look at a, an image or a picture. Uh, in this case, you can see 100% contrast but after uh, it goes through some kind of imaging system, uh, it will uh, basically blur. I mean, this imaging system with, will blur it somehow. So the contrast will no longer be 100%. And uh, the function that describes how blurred this uh, image is, is the so-called point spread function. And with a Fourier transform applied to this, we will get this so-called modulation transfer function, uh, which is a very good standardized and uh, quantitative uh, measure to tell something about uh, the spatial resolution. Uh, in medical imaging, we usually use 10% uh, modulation transfer function. Uh, it is measured in line pair per millimeter or centimeter, which uh, describes how many line pairs we can fit into one millimeter or one centimeter. Uh, just very briefly, how we got this MTF for uh, the Derenzo phantom. So I uh, grouped or parted this uh, workflow into two uh, bigger steps. Uh, the first is uh, getting the average point spread function for each rod size uh, that is still distinguishable. Uh, for this, we first subtract the mean background from uh, the uh, uh, circle uh, inside the phantom where there is no uh, sectors or rods. Uh, then we find one of these sectors. And then if we do a 60 percent, uh, 60 degree rotation, we will find all of the uh, sectors. We will uh, cut these out. And with a thresholding, we will try to search for these unique blobs and uh, average them. You can see this here. These are the blobs. We average them and get uh, the point spread function and take the radial profile of it. And the second bigger step is getting the uh, modulation transfer function from this uh, point spread function, which is basically the two-dimensional Fourier transformation of the point spread function. Uh, we get the radial profile of it, uh, fit a sigmoid uh, function on it, and take its 10% uh, value. Uh, you can see here um, two different uh, reconstructions of the Derenzo phantom. 
one made with uh, uh, 200,000 protons and the other one is with approximately 1 million protons. You can see that the MTF uh, is better for uh, the bigger proton number reconstruction. And also it could find uh, the four millimeter diameter uh, rod sector as well. And it couldn't when uh, we used only 200,000 protons. I also wanted to check uh, the average uh, MTF 10%. Uh, when I talk about averaging, I mean averaging on uh, these rods or on these uh, sectors. Uh, and I also uh, checked a realistic case, which is uh, the one I talked about when we have an uncertainty for the energy. And an ideal case when we add no uh, error in this energy. And you can see that these, uh, these values or these, uh, the uh, shape of this uh, curve, if we fit a curve on it, is uh, sort of uh, similar. And also the biggest, so the best MTF value is also very, very similar. It's around 1.7 line pair per centimeter. Uh, of which we can say that uh, this uh, uh, reconstruction is insensitive for uh, errors in energy. Uh, now, I very quickly want to talk a bit about the CTP404 phantom. You can see, again, uh, reconstruction with different proton numbers. We see the same tendency as we saw for the uh, Derenzo phantom. And what I wanted to check is uh, the RSP numbers of these rods, which you can see uh, with these uh, pretty colorful numbers. Uh, this first is the ground truth uh, image of the phantom, uh, which is made of the uh, open source available macro of the phantom. And then you see the reconstructed image and the same reconstructed image uh, with two different types of blurring on it. Uh, I just wanted to check if it gives better results. And I summarized these results in this diagram on which you can see the RSP values and the relative difference uh, between the ground truth and the three different uh, reconstructed uh, RSP values. Um, and as you can see, this relative difference goes uh, up to 6%, uh, which is uh, still uh, can be improved. Uh, however, we can say that uh, this is a relatively good uh, accuracy. Uh, I also wanted to check the differences between the uh, RSP values of the ground truth and the reconstructed images. And I uh, show this uh, here for uh, different iterations. And uh, I have seen uh, that at the 57th batch, there is uh, that, uh, some uh, outlier pixels appear. Uh, which then start to get better again. And I wanted to check if uh, this trend can be seen if we use some kind of quantitative measurement. And I use the mean absolute error for this, which is the average absolute difference between the corresponding pixels. And as you can see, uh, as the proton number increases, uh, the mean absolute error uh, first uh, decreases rapidly. And then uh, indeed, around this 57th batch, you can see this jump here, uh, which uh, indicates the outliers. Uh, I just wanted to show you a quick comparison to other results in literature. So the MTF 10% values uh, were also uh, investigated in uh, an article. They used uh, a water tank and they used uh, five different depths. As you can see, our results are slightly worse. Uh, however, they didn't mention anything about the runtime. So it is possible that our runtime is better. Uh, and the RSP reconstruction accuracy uh, was examined by an other uh, article uh, who had, again, better results. They uh, did 1% uh, reconstruction accuracy compared to our 6%. However, uh, they even mentioned that they used uh, Bayesian interference-based proton path probability map for uh, this most likely path calculation, which is, uh, they mentioned that this is uh, slower than our cubic spline fitting for um, MLP calculations. So 
we did a uh, worse accuracy but faster okay so i think i ran out of time so uh, i would just summarize very quickly uh, my achievements and future plans so i have optimized this framework uh, that utilizes this uh, algorithm for proton ct image reconstruction that hasn't been hasn't yet been used for this uh, I tested this framework on two phantoms and found a relatively good results. I earned a TDK uh, third place with this, and uh, I have just submitted my master's thesis like two hours ago. <laughs> so, uh, yes, uh, and my future plans include uh, further developments, for example, uh, using uh, machine learning for the MLP calculation. And thank you very much for the attention. We have time for a few short questions. Um, at the first, just a, a comment that is very nice talk, but I, I think I, I will probably focus on accuracy over speed. Getting worse results faster, that's not sounding good to me, especially well, not in the medical field. So, sure. Uh, in our, in this case, uh, Actually, runtime is a critical uh, point uh, since uh, when we uh, do this imaging, uh, there is, of course, a patient. And uh, if we wait too much uh, with this imaging, then it will result in uh, the patient's uh, organs, for example, uh, move slightly, which would uh, require starting this uh, image reconstruction again if we wait too much so it's actually a critical point but you are right that uh, of course accuracy is is a very important part of this as well yeah uh, I, I can't remember what was the execution time that you oh, yeah I, I think i forgot to mention it sorry uh yeah so uh the execution time in the first version of this algorithm was uh sometimes almost one and a half days and now the reconstruction time is uh between 400 and 600 600 seconds mm. so it improved significantly okay that sounds good so keep, keep up the work and make Thank it you. more accurate <laughs> <laughs> i'm just speculating that uh you have mentioned that uh in yes. The, the the photons uh, uh, go in straight lines, but but the, the protons are uh, declined by the yes, regress yes. scattering. Doesn't it spoil the the focus of the photo, of proton beam? Yeah. So how how much focus can be reached? Uh, so if I understand that, so the deeper the the photon beam the proton beam uh, comes, then the 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 biggest the its 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 spread will be. Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, now, this we can uh, shift slightly or, or set with uh, the initial energy of the protons, because, uh, of course, the bigger initial energy it has, the less scattering or the less uh, smaller angles it will scatter. Uh, so, yeah, we can we can shift it slightly. And I also haven't mentioned it, but it's important that when we do this imaging, this uh, Bragg peak will be uh behind or after the patient of course not in their body uh, because uh when when we do uh the treatment this is the time when we will need this BRAC curve to be inside the patient so yeah uh now um these protons that uh scatter with a big angle will be sort of filtered out of the imaging so this is how we can say that they uh so they don't go in a straight line. However, the scattering angles are, are and that's how this uh, so-called cubic spline fitting can work when we estimate the most likely path. Uh, uh, maybe I can. So maybe if I understood your question was was it about the, the the beam structure will be, yeah. Yeah, so I, I think Jofi mentioned that the beam has a the width of, of what? The original beam, what you have, the 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 proton beam, what you have yeah. from the source. 
reaching the patient what was what is the size it's 0.6 uh, millimeter or like that no yeah sorry. yeah so we are using a, a realistic gaussian shaping for the scanning and of course there's a little bit of uh, increase but those are who are very much going away we can cut out of the of the distributions this was what you in treatment, uh, you need the focus uh, because the, the, the deposit of the energy will destroy the, the tissues there. So the quick question is that whether the, 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 the spreading of the of the of the of the line of the beam but doesn't spoil the the, the focus. Yeah. It certainly does. It's a couple of millimeters when it arrives to the tumor. Yeah, yeah but it's a Gaussian profile. Yeah. So that means that the main is going in the proper direction. And there are two things. So this this is for imaging. So this will yeah. go through the patients. The the, the the other one is is a different story. Yeah. So I think let's move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Oh. And the next speaker will be Ben Sadudash, who will continue on the previous 